do you guys want to start? Marley Wright, Microsoft. Um, Andreas Freund, Consensus. Uh, Jim Dan Kaleido. Engineer Machine 2. You are indeed challenge. Laser Isaac, Michelangelo Consensus. Josh Lankiewicz and Isaac. Sanjay from Intel. So as you can see, uh, it's quite a uh, cross uh, company effort. So, so today, you know, we're going to talk about uh, uh, this off-chain trusted compute. This work started off almost two years ago, uh, and uh, within the context of enterprise Ethereum, uh, as an option uh, to address scalability and privacy. Uh, so, uh, what I will do quickly is, like, you know, give you some little bit of a history and. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, drop into you know the meaty details of it. So we were uh, 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 and uh, we were, we were gonna show actually walk you through some uh, uh, hands-on uh, demonstrations, but uh, the internet access here is very interesting. So we're gonna just walk you through and uh, give you enough uh, pointers on GitHub where you guys can uh, go and uh, uh, you know try it out uh, at your uh, at your own uh, convenience. Um, so, uh, uh, so there, will, there are going to be two of these walkthroughs uh, that the uh, team will introduce, and then uh, hopefully we will have enough time to have some case studies that uh, 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 three case studies that people have put together around how they are using trusted compute. So, uh, uh, quick on enterprise Ethereum, uh, it's it's a, uh, a, the focus is how to apply Ethereum in the enterprise world, uh, and. Uh, uh, the, the main uh, challenges when it comes to uh, enterprise, uh, we call them three P's, uh, permissioning, privacy, and uh, performance. Uh, so uh, we looked at, uh, you know, uh, performance and privacy are uh, two of the more uh, important ones, and uh, uh, we, we looked at, like, a, a, you know, your trusted compute as an option uh, for solving those kinds of things. Uh, so we have made a lot of progress on that one. Uh, we introduced it last year, uh, 0.5 spec at Dev DevCon 4, and uh, now we have a 1.0 spec out there, and uh, and uh, uh, reference implementations also are available for people to play with, and we'll walk you through some of that uh, in, uh, uh, in in the in, in the session. Uh, yeah, and and as, as I said, is like you know the. Uh, uh, some of the key salient features of this uh, spec are uh, privacy, uh, you know, confidentiality of the data uh, as required for the enterprises, uh, attested oracles, uh, and and uh, you know, and uh, also support for uh, things like decentralized identities. In it, uh, it's a pretty rich spec. Uh, it has gone through a lot of work, and uh, uh, yeah, and you know, you're more than welcome to take a look at it and see how it fits into your businesses. Uh, the uh, and the thing is, like right now, the spec uh, has. When we talk about trusted compute, it is a lot of the TE in it. But uh, what we have in there is uh, is supporting of uh, other other forms of uh, trusted computation, like uh, zk proofs, uh, multi-party computation, and things like that. Uh, a lot of that is in there. So, uh, but a lot more work needs to be done. Uh, with that, uh, you know, I will hand off to. Uh, you. To me, to uh, Andreas Farr. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Um, I would like to um, say first uh, a thank you to all the collaborators. Um, it was truly um, an amazing journey. Um, it is the first time that the EA has produced shippable code, and it is the largest um, enterprise collaboration in the blockchain space. Period. Right? There are five companies that have worked together to, to produce uh, this uh, EA Trusted <laughs> Reward Token. Um, this is the goal of, of this, um, uh, um, of this uh, uh, token, token model, is to incentivize participation of EA member organizations and their employees. Um, why is that um, important? Um, because it is very hard to get people to contribute. It's always the same usual suspects. Um, and uh, the goal is to apply some of the learnings from um, you know, the open ecosystem space 
um, around incentive models to see whether they can be leveraged in the enterprise. So there is experimentation um, with um, different token principles and design uh, templates. We're eating um, our own dog food here. Um, we want to create synergies with other EA groups, so the testnet group, the token taxonomy initiative that Marley is heading, um, and the new technical token working group, as well as open Ethereum specs, so the ERCs, um, Mike will talk about that, and then um, web standards, W3C, we're actually using the W3C standards for DIDs and Farifable credentials. Mike will also talk about that. Um, and this is really the use case for the Trusted Compute Framework spec and the EA uh, Trusted Compute Testnet. So that, that's, that's really, really uh, important and we are creating a first simple use case that is actually usable um, and that is um, also a first so enterprises can actually start using tokens um, uh, in their in their day-to-day -day operations because this model is easily transferable um, into one enterprise or between multiple um, enterprises and other consortia. And with that, I want to hand it over to Marley to talk a little bit more about the details of the token model. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so um, what we wanted to do was to figure out the business process of solving the difficult problem. How do you get consortiums comprised of multiple uh, corporations, some of which might compete with each other, to actually lean in and do the work to contribute to the benefit of all, which is pretty difficult to actually pull off. Um, so we wanted to create an incentive, uh, I like to call them behavioral modification protocols, to incent good behavior and punish bad behavior. Um, but you also have to, because we're trying to scope out work that needs to occur, you need to uh, do this in a way that you, you say it's the potential to earn these rewards. So we'll talk about the the tokens, and then we'll talk about uh, how we actually grant them really quickly. First off, we um, when we, we do these, we essentially create a, a grant, and it's um, the, the potential for an organization that's given to the organization to receive X number of reward tokens if they achieve the goal laid out in the grant. Um, and, um, and that's the potential, and they can have individual contributors. So the actual people that are doing the work, we want to actually uh, get the credit for doing that work, um, be able to use it, so we can list who those people are, and they can you know, uh, get a percentage of that total award if it's achieved. Um, there's also a punishment. Well, the punishment may equal the sum or negative value of the total award, um, and um, and you can set that in the grant as well. And then uh, there's also something we call a reputation token, so we'll talk about that as well. Those are granted. Those are uh, one for one with the uh, reward token. But essentially what the reward token does is it's a, um, it's a, a token that, um, that organizations can, when you are granted them, let's say you're the, um, the uh, reward grant vests and you're rewarded, the organization is rewarded those tokens, um, they can take those tokens and redeem them for value of some sort. We'll talk about what we're actually providing here in a minute. Uh, you go to the next slide, it's fine. So you can go out and, and shop at the EEA swag store and get some really interesting materials, um, some t-shirts, uh, dinner with Ron. Uh, that doesn't mean Ron's gonna pay the dinner. Though. You just get to have Ron come with you. No, the EEA pays the dinner. <laughs> and then, uh, but, and, and sunglasses. But this, this was more for just um, to show what you could do, really. Uh, one of the things we wanted to put in the grant as well is to have, because it's uh, consortiums, we made up organizations, we might have participants like Microsoft contribute um, to have a bounty in there and say, hey, we're going to put up some surfaces or some Xboxes so that contributors they actually meet the goal, they'll actually get something they want um, at the end of that goal. So uh, really we want to leave the model open to say that you could reward them. So interesting things about this is, um, if you get a reward token, the reputation flows to the individual, so the individuals will get a percentage if there's 100 tokens and there are three or two participants, you can divide up those reputation points that if it was equal effort by both participants, then they'll get 50 reputation points each. And the cumulative will roll up to the individual. Penalty tokens um, are essentially are negative value. Um, they all have to be redeemed before you can redeem your reward tokens. So they'll, 
uh, decrease your overall balance for you know, dictating whether or not you have to settle for the autograph sunglasses that I provide, um, or um, you know, even you know, have to go slumming down with a t-shirt. Uh, so this is how these tokens will work and, uh, and create this business model for doing that. So let's move on. Yeah, so I think uh, uh, now what we'll get into is like, you know, the real meat in terms of like, you know, uh, how this trusted token was implemented and why the trusted compute actually all fits in and everything else. So, so Lee, you want to do that? Good, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, since early last year, so Isaac has been significantly working with Intel consensus and the other EA members to work on the uh, trust computing framework and move forward the related specifications and interesting use case, just like EEA token. So firstly, before talking about technical details, I would like to take two minutes to talk about a phenomenal question for me. Why we need actually offload the on-chain execution to the, to the off-chain trust execution environment. So nowadays, there are a lot of uh, on-chain applications that are smoothly running on on-chain network to support a number, of, a great number of interesting use cases. But for some of these use cases, we are just uh, starting realizing that there could kind of be limits. Take example, what about if the execution is becoming, uh, uh, needs to be upgraded frequently? So if everything's uh, deployed on the on-chain networks, it will be costly, right? And for some other use cases, some execution, execution logic could be very, very complex and sophisticated. And it is, just, it is co cost, costly. And if it's running on the uh, Ethereum virtual machine, probably it's not so efficient if the application becomes so sophisticated, right? So we have an idea. Why don't we just migrate this execution from the on-chain to the off-chain trusted execution environment? So, if the application runs in the on-chain network, uh, runs on the off-chain networks, so whenever you want up upgrade applications, it just represents nearly, nearly zero cost, and the off-chain uh, execution can hold sophisticated applications. Uh, with incremental efficiency. What's more, in the off-chain networks, the, all the execution logic can be coded in uh, almost any of the uh, mainstream languages like Java, Python, JavaScript, or Go, even C or C++, right? So, and what's more, the uh, execution running in the off-chain networks, it has offers bad performance because it's just executed once based on, on the uh, compiled code. It allows to uh, very uh, seamlessly talking with external data source uh, based on the corresponding API course. And one of the great features brought by the TEE is that it offers an end-to-end -end privacy preserving. Actually, all this data could be strictly encrypted the decryption can only happen inside this uh, TE enclave. So the uh, privacy is guaranteed by the hardware level security. So here's a diagram that you can see that originally we can deploy a smart contract and trigger a smart contract via the on-chain network based on a private key here, which is used to uh, sign the blockchain transaction. And now we could migrate this smart contract execution logic to the off-chain trust execution uh, environment enclave. And we only need to transfer uh, this private key to this STE enclave via a high secure channel. And after applying the execution logic, a blockchain transaction can be transferred directly from the TE enclave in the name, so this tr blocking transaction is triggered in the name of the, o the, the owner here because only uh, the, the private key is transferred to ETE enclave and no one else is able to inspect and tamper this uh, private key. 
So in this way, we can offload the execution from on-chain to off-chain networks without sacrificing the user experience, without sacrificing the trustedness and security. Could you move? So uh, as I just mentioned, that is a great idea to migrate the uh, execution from the on-chain to off-chain if, for example, if the execution is to be upgraded uh, very frequently. So that is the case for the TE uh, token execution logic. So here is a diagram of the uh, architecture diagram of the TE token, uh, which is composed by uh, four principal parts. So here are the UI parts, which allows a user to find the uh, EA token request. And the EA token request uh, could be then captured by the TE listener model. And the TE listener model could then uh, trigger the TE SGX applications, so which represent TE uh, EEA token uh, execution logic, runs inside the SGX uh, uh, TE enclave, so SGX enclave, which is deployed uh, in the Microsoft Azure uh, SGX virtual machine. And after applying the execution logic, the blockchain transaction can be triggered from the TE enclave directly in the name of the TEA administrator. So uh, this, uh, as Andrew has mentioned, this is a great uh, cooperation work from the different EA members. So the Evision blockchain takes charge of the implementation of the UI part, and Isaac takes charge of the implementation of the TEA listener, uh, as well as the uh, TEA SGX application implement implementation and deploy the trust compute, compute framework to the Microsoft Azure uh, uh, SGX virtual machine. Isaac also takes charge of the implementation of the TCF TEE contract. And Consensus takes charge of the implementation of the EEA uh, trust token uh, smart contracts. Uh, Clido takes charge of the deploying the uh, blockchain networks. Actually, the blockchain networks is based on Clido network. Um, based on the uh, high player uh, 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 Dashu, so previous name is Passion. So uh, I leave Mike oh, sorry, sorry, to talk about the uh, smart Thank you. Uh, so in the smart contract layer, we have three components. The one tokens, second are the decentralized identifiers or DITs, and the third one is going to be verifiable claims. So how we make this ecosystem work is we deployed these three contracts as an, an, an operator contract on tops, managing the contract's admin functions such as burn, mint, transfer, uh, etc. Right. So to be able to do that, we need to make sure that we have uh, the participants that are receiving the tokens are one employees of an organization, and two the organization is a member of the EEA, and that is where the ERC 780 and the 1056 come come into play. The ERC-780 is a contract, uh, it's a claims registry contract, originally developed by Uport, and we've adapted it for this use case, and essentially it's a contract where we allow the EEA admin to specify which organizations are members of the EEA. And then the second uh, contract is going to be the Ethereum DID registry, or the 1056. That's also a contract uh, standard that's been, that was developed by Uport. And it's going to allow an organization to specify who is an employee of the organization. So this is not an EA admin function because we don't want that function. We want the organizations themselves to specify who's working on their behalf or their delegates. So the function we're actually really interested in is the set delegate function in 1056 so that organizations can actually set the employees as delegates working on their behalf so that when we mint tokens, the EA admin, when they select mint tokens, it's going to check, one, is the organization an EEA member through the 780? And then two, it's going to check if the employee is, uh, the participant is an employee of the organization through the 1056. And then from there, we mint the tokens uh, based on what the amount. OK. 
Okay, so this is going to get uh, increasingly more complex, so let's just bear with us. Um, before we step through this chart, uh, let's, uh, let's use an example of why are we bothering doing all this stuff. That's, that's the heart of the trust to compute. So who, who uh, knows about ERC-20? Right? So we're talking about tokens, non-fungible tokens. Um, so uh, uh, ERC-721? Okay, so fungible tokens and non-fungible tokens. I run those in, in the chain, everybody knows who they're going to, and I have issuer that has the secret key and sign them and push the request and you get the token. What's the problem? Why do we need all this in the middle? Um, let's use, use this example. Uh, let's say Ron is the, the holder of the secret key that can issue tokens, link the token to organization one so they get some reputation tokens, right? And let's see, let's say, um, well actually, Ron looks uncorruptos, so that's not gonna work. Let's say <laughs> Charles. <laughs> Charles is, uh, is the holder of the private keys. And I know Charles for a long time, so I know he loves exotic whiskey, right? So we're gonna make a deal. Charles, for every token you issue to Kaleido, I'm gonna give you a case of whiskeys. So what, what this means is, as long as I can corrupt the key, secret key holder, I can get all the tokens I want, right? And there's no um, safeguard to make sure that transaction is, is legit. You can only trust as much as you trust the person that holds the private key. So what we want is some sort of safeguard to make sure when the minting request is being um, issued, it's issued with, uh, by meeting a bunch of criteria that's set in place. Okay, now you, you think about this. We need criteria. Why don't we just put them in a smart contract that stands in front of ERC-20 and does the validation and then calls ERC-20, right? That's easy to solve. It can be solved this way if all your checking can be done on the chain. If all the data is available on chain, you can do this very easily. There's, there are a lot of situations where the checking needs to consult external databases, look at the logs, look at the meeting minutes from administrators, and do the validation from outside resources that's not reachable from smart contracts. And that's where this kind of solution makes it uh, very handy. So let's, uh, let's uh, step through this and see how this works in the cover. Right, so, <clears throat> Before this can flow end to end, we need to do two things. We need to make sure the, uh, ending, uh, the secret keys are in place. So first of all, <clears throat> you have the, the front end and you have the blockchain. And then somebody needs to hold the, the signing key that has the uh, special power of minting tokens. So that's gonna uh, exist at this layer we call uh, trusted compute listener. This is basically the API uh, service that makes uh, the system work together with the front end. Um, and then this is gonna call some trusted system that you can say, when this system is executing some logic, I can be somehow guaranteed and convinced that it's running the right logic. Uh, and the magic is in the, the Intel guys uh, technology called SGX, um, safe, software guard extension. guard extension, thank you. So that you can be convinced that when it executes uh, some logic, uh, you know exactly what kind of logic was being uh, executed in terms of uh, getting a proof or attestation from that component. Uh, because of that, we know that <clears throat> uh, to, to mint the token, we have to uh, have uh, participation records uh, issuing uh, 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 let's say uh, the organization participate in uh, GitHub, uh, GitHub commits that contributed to the publication of the next spec. That sort of thing can be checked here and all the logic can run and they can call any APIs they want, whether they are on-chain or off-chain, off -chain, because this is just a regu regular compo uh, component that uh, does compute. So that's the beauty of this solution. Uh, once we've got the keys in the right place, uh, the admin 
Charles in this case, logs into the UI and then says, okay, Clido did some good work, let's give him some, some tokens. Uh, send a request that's going to be uh, uh, accepted by uh, the trusted listener. And the listener now needs to talk in um, um, uh, secure mode so that this request going to the trusted compute uh, component is going to be uh, secured by um, public encryption. So only the component here can decrypt. So now the workload goes to trusted compute. It's going to do the, um, you know, the logic and checking. And eventually, once it passes the criteria, finally the uh, token issuance request is made and tokens issued and everybody's happy. So that's the flow. Uh, this is only one pattern of uh, what you can do with trusted compute. Uh, there's other like Oracle pen patterns where you can use it to get uh, external data. And you can be assured that what, when it's grabbing data from external sources, they're not manipulating them, right? So um, there are very sensitive data in the world that can mean like m millions and billions of dollars, even if you tweak it just a tiny bit. When you are getting that data from this kind of components, you know they're not manipulating. So, um, What we have done uh, with the uh, EEA token uh, project is, if you go to this link, you will see all the components that's involved to make this work. Um, Mike already took you through the smart contracts. Uh, it took about 10 different smart contracts to work together. Um, so take your time to understand what each of them do. Um, and then the TE layer uh, that iExec folks did uh, has two components. One is that uh, API layer that takes the request from the UI, and then th that launches the, the worker node that actually does the processing through a secure channel. And finally, the Envision folks, uh, Envision blockchain folks did the, the UI work uh, to make it integrate into the EA member uh, website. And finally, Marley and his team did uh, modeling to make sure uh, the stuff that we do is compliant to the uh, TTF uh, spec. So you can check out the stuff um, from the repository. And you, if you have any questions, feel free to open the issue and, and we can engage. Um, to, to help folks understand that this is real and this works, um, we did a live deployment that's running uh, in Azure uh, and Clido so that uh, all the components outside of blockchain is deployed to, to Azure, including the, the uh, SGX um, cluster. And then the blockchain itself is, uh, is managed by Clido, which is also on Azure. And then um, if you want to try this yourself, right, how these different components work together under the cover, uh, we also created, created a local environment that's based on Docker and Docker Compose. So just following uh, the README, you can, you can um, try this yourself and run everything end to end without relying uh, uh, on the Oh yeah, if somebody, uh, anybody is, is, is welcome to create a Bounty project and see how people can improve on top of this, right? What we've done is one pattern, again, this is just one pattern you can do with TCF and there's you know, other, other patterns you can implement. That's a great idea. Um, all right, so um, before I go to the code, uh, this is sort of the, the, the simple, simplified version of the local environment compared to the real version that's deployed to the cloud. Uh, we have these components that I already talked to you about. So how the, 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 at the heart of the uh, secure compute component is a secure channel between the um, component that's owned by EEA admin, and at some point that needs to call a stateless worker node that's, you know, can serve anybody, 
So how does that com uh, uh, communication happen securely is through a secure channel. If you want to know any details, ask these guys. Um, but um, we obviously we don't need that for a local environment. So what we do is uh, using a shared uh, uh, file system, we have something generated by the T listener that's committed to a file system, and this file system is, is shared by the worker node. So that's how the secure uh, provisioning is happening between the two. And then the, um, um, the blockchain itself is uh, Hyperledger Besu, uh, running uh, locally uh, through Docker Compo uh, Compose. Right, let's, uh, let's take a look. I, I mentioned the um, uh, GitHub. So if you go to uh, the GitHub at the link, um, switch to DevCon uh, branch, and then you can see. Of course. Uh, all right, never mind. We don't need that uh, for the demo. Um, go to the DevCon branch, and then go to the local folder, and then there's a readme <coughs> through all the steps you want. So if you want to try this at home, you can you can do that. All you all you need is uh, Docker and uh, Node.js. Okay, so. Uh, what I've got is I've got three different Docker Compose that uh, puts the system together. The first one is the, the, the deep backend, which is blockchain itself. Uh, it runs Hyperledger Besu, version, the latest version, I think, uh, which is 1.2.4. Uh, for every Besu node, we need to run the companion Component, which is uh, essentially the wallet, because we're, we're lazy, we don't want to do external signing, uh, so we just ask the node to do the signing for us. Uh, and this is giving the Besu node a, uh, a wallet. So that's what ETH signer does here. And then we have another Besu node uh, and another wallet that goes with it. So that's pretty simple, let's fire this up. It's creating the two nodes and two um, uh, wallets, right? So it's all working fine so far. And you can uh, connect to them. Let's see if I have a... Uh, you can attach to that. See that it's running for real. Okay, so there you have it. Uh, we were in the console. We can see that it's it's already at block fourteen thousand something because I've been running this environment for a while. That's why it's got a bunch of blocks already. Um, so now we have the backend. Let's uh, fire up the uh, contract. So I've already deployed the contract. So I, I'm not I'm not going to deploy it again. But it, what it does is, um, you should just explain it. Yeah. It's unreadable. <laughs> it won't get readable. We, we believe okay. you. <laughs> <laughs> so there are these uh, one, two, three, ten different uh, smart contracts that gives you a registry. It gives you a registry of the orgs. So when, when a request goes to uh, the smart contracts to issue a token to the org, it's using the registry to, to verify that this org uh, has been registered. And then when you want to issue to an employee, then the claims reg registry is, uh, is, uh, look, is used to verify that there's a claim about the associations of this employee to that organization. So that's how these things work. And then the main logic of processing uh, the issue, the, the burn of the tokens, is operator. So that's the main thing where the logics uh, exist. And you have the, the different uh, token uh, contracts. Uh, under the cover, they're all based on ERC-777. Uh, instead of uh, ERC-20, it's an improved version of ERC-20 for non-fungible tokens. Uh, for fungible tokens. So that's been deployed. Uh, let's uh, 
start the middle tier, which is the T stuff. Um, so we have another doctor here. So what this does is it gives the, uh, the APIs uh, for the UI to call um, and then process requests. So this only needs one component, uh, one Docker uh, instance because the, the actual worker nodes are spun up by this uh, on demand. When there's a work uh, when there's a work request, it spins up a new instance of the worker node and then have it process it and then clean it up afterwards. Got that. Finally, let's uh, get the UI. The UI has four different components. Uh, it's got the, the HTML layer, the, the backend layer uh, in Node.js, and then a uh, Nginx for load balancing, and uh, a database to save uh, local information. So we've got everything running now. Let's look at the UI. OK, so. Uh, Need to do a login, so that's um, the default is admin pwd. So that's the uh, when you try this yourself, uh, a, uh, admin pwd with the capitalized p is the password. Very secure for sure. For the e is. Or you have to ask Charles. Um, right, yeah. For Apollo, was the password. Yeah. So the, the first thing you do as a EA, EA uh, admin is to register some members, right? So let's register uh, on as a organization. Uh, email on right. Right. It is a password. So this is going to call the um, uh, DID registry to register this um, new member uh, within the organization. And it's stuck somehow. Let's take a look. What's happening in the program? Save user. Right? So it's supposed to call. Oh, I know what's happening. Okay. Uh, I'm using the wrong branch. Yeah, I need to switch to um, DevCon. Remember to use DevCon branch when, uh, when you work with this. because earlier I was uh, trying to connect the system to the cloud deployment. Uh, that's obviously not the right uh, configuration. Right. Try this again. Register. Okay, uh, looks better. 
So now we've got, we've got a member um, as that's part of this consortium. Let's say EEA itself is a consortium. We just added DEFCON 5 as a brand new member. So now we're going to ask the admin of DEFCON 5 to add some inquiries. So I'm going to log in as DEFCON 5 admin. And as of now, I have zero tokens. So I need to register some employees that's going to be assigned to work with EEA on great stuff, right? So employee one, uh, it's going to be part of that on five. As you can see, the email, we don't really use it to verify uh, identities. It's just you can give any email address you want. All right, so now we have an employee that's um, a part of DevCon 5. Let's go back and say, you know, in half a year, uh, DevCon 5 employee 1 has been participating in all calls, and even chaired some calls, and even contributed to the next version of the spec, right? So it's time to give them some tokens. So they can have their dinner they've been waiting for with Ron. Um, Okay, so it's going to be for DevCon 5, employee 1, because they've written um, contributions. So what's happening on the cover is um, uh, what is it called? T listener 1. So <clears throat> This is all new. Um, TE Listener 1, which is the API server, uh, just saw that uh, request from the UI, and then it understands that this is a request to issue some tokens. So it generated some command, uh, and then um, asked uh, the worker node to um, process this command. So the processing of the command is done in the trusted mode, right, by the, by the trusted component. And as a result, some uh, reward tokens were minted. So let's see if DevCon 5 actually got that. I think it's Gmail. Did I use Gmail? Yep. OK. All right. You got 100 tokens because you did that. So. Um, um, if you didn't under, if you didn't know what's happening under the cover, this may be underwhelming. But if you actually know that in this system, there's no way anybody can can uh, uh, bribe Charles to get free tokens, then that's a really good thing. <laughs> so thank you. Thanks, Jim, for the uh, demo. So uh, that demo is in runs in the simulation mode, uh, which runs every component run on the same uh, local machine, right? So uh, here, actually, there's something running in the hardware mode, which is for the real use case. So basically, the PE, the components, uh, and, and deploy on Microsoft Azure SGX virtual machine. And uh, the blockchain based on the Clido networks. So the hardware mode, here the architecture of the, for the EEA token hardware mode, it's kind of more complicated. Uh, the, diff the principal difference uh, compared to the simulation mode is, for, is focused on the security enhancements. So uh, basically for the UI part, it, it's the same. So uh, UI can uh, the users can file an EA token request, and the EA token request could be uh, captured by the TE listener via a GWT uh, SKU channel. And 
the T listener is in the scope of the EEA administrator. Uh, so the EEA administrator can just inject uh, signing key, the private key to the T listener, and T listener will transfer this key to a secret management management service, which is also running inside the Intel SGX enclave. And meanwhile, the T listener will also encrypt the uh, token request and push the encrypt token re request to a data storage server. So all these components uh, are uh, stays in the EEA administrator components, not yet go out of that scope. So uh, the next step is that TEE will trigger the off-chain uh, off trusted execution. So there are two ways of uh, triggering the, uh, the TE applications the direct model and the proxy model. So for the direct model, actually TEE will query the blockchain and saying, hey, I want to trick for example, uh, register work one, what is what his IP address and his configuration information. Then he could uh, dialogue with the uh, with this information retrieved from the blockchain, he can then uh, dialogue with the register work and trigger the off-chain trust computing. So this is direct model, it's much, it's much more simple. And for the proxy model, actually T listener will also uh, find a new blockchain transaction, say that I will uh, run this uh, execution logic uh, for the uh, registered worker A, and the registered worker A will, uh, will be always listening to the blockchain events, and as, uh, as soon as he captured this blockchain events, he will trigger the uh, TE applications. So as soon as the TE application is triggered, a uh, SKU channel is established uh, between the security, manage security management service and the remote TE enclave. So this remote, remote uh, security channel is also called, called SGX, uh, secret provision channel. So the signing king, uh, the, the private king used to sign the blockchain uh, transaction by the EEA administrator, it can be transferred to the TEE enclave. So uh, I would like to underline once again that the, uh, the king uh, running inside the enclave is guaranteed by the hardware, Intel SGX uh, hardware level uh, security. So even the owner of the TE, uh, the machine, is not able to penetrate this enclave and still or tamper the, uh, this private key. So uh, the encrypted data, encrypted data also uh, pulled pull to the uh, TE applications. So TE applications is not is able to decrypt the data and apply the execution execution logic, and finally can find a blockchain transaction directly to the blockchain networks based on the. There's a there's a question. Okay. Uh, the question is that uh, in this Intel trust environment, right, the key to the secret enclave does the the administrator will have the access. Oh, this one. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, this one. Uh, as since he uh, he also has is running inside Intel SGX some enclave. So even you don't trust this machine, because all the kings are running inside the enclave. So actually, when this machine runs, when this enclave starts running, it will also do the remote hesitation. So, so I mean, essentially, you have an admin cluster which will own this key to the secret enclave. Yeah, but so but this one is also in the admin scope, actually. I know, so, but essentially, you have to inherit trust admin. So is there a case that with a consortium that each member can... Yeah, good question. Actually, for the token uh, issuance, for the uh, all the token insurance uh, request is only filed by the administrator. Actually, but this uh, for different use case. For example, if a organization he want to uh, uh, maintain the reputation token for different employees, so this could be uh, in the organization scope. So that is for a different use case. So for this token insurance is only for the EA administ administrator scope. So uh, so uh, the uh, the, e, the transaction, blockchain transaction can be uh, triggered to the blockchain directly based on the signing, based on this signing key. So in the name of the EEA administrator, right? So in this way that we can see that we can off, off chain all the execution from on chain to uh, from on chain to off chain without providing 
are compromising the security and trust needs and the user experience. So, like, uh, uh, so th this, this is like a real world application that we have, uh, you know, deployed as part of uh, it's an uh, EES spec compliant implementation, the first of its kind, and hopefully we'll use it with an EEA or uh, in the in the real, real way. And uh, now the uh, now now the other part is like you know, so we talked about this application. Uh, the second part is like Eugene will walk us through some of the, you know, okay, what does it take to write, uh, uh, you know, we talked about, hey, you, know, you can implement this thing in, in the SGXT. So how, how hard or how easy is it? So he's going to walk through this framework that we have put together and that will be open source to uh, walk you through, you know, how we're making it easy to write a Hello World kind of an example. Can you hear me without mic? No. No. No, you just try to speak with Yeah, just a question. I get this when there's like a single governor. How would this model work if you had to share the trusted logic to ensure that multiple parties are running the same exact trusted logic and agreeing on this is for you for your permission? If that is possible, then how would you distribute that trusted logic in a way? So, so you can repeat the question. Well, it seems like this model works if you have a single admin of the system and you have trusted logic that's put. But I'm curious when you have multiple parties that have to run the same exact trusted logic. Yes. How do you guarantee the I think the, 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 these guys may have more specific answer. My view is that the point that you're using this centralized component there is that you can trust it. Typically, you don't trust a centralized component. Because there's operator, there's there's some code that you don't know hidden away in some machines. You can't trust the centralized component, right? But this is a special kind of central com component that you can trust because you can ask Intel to give you a attestation that's signed by Intel. If you found it wrong, you can sue Intel, and that's a pretty good thing <laughs> to do, right? Which means you can trust this, and there's no reason that you have to run a decentralized system. So you wouldn't use this for a model if you had like calculations that you wanted more parties to run. So it, maybe we'll have an opportunity to present our use case. But basically, it's a very good question. But SGX allows you <coughs> to attest the code that runs inside the enclave. So you publish it, and everybody, every participant can verify that what runs inside the enclave is what has been agreed upon. Yeah, sure. Can I uh, answer that question? Sure. But see, this is why we have all these people. So, uh, I'm saying uh, we built this TCF implementation as a blockchain. So, we have multiple nodes from the SGX instance. We have a smart contract for them to run the compound uh, as nodes, and then they can form contact. So, we can actually build a, uh, a blockchain kind of concept of silence. And through that, you can get the version. So can you repeat the answer, Mike? Can you repeat the answer? I think in the interest of time, I think we'll get going, like because uh, uh, he, uh, the, he answered him about the attestation and things like that. So, oh, you have a question? Yeah, the question goes all along the same line. If you're everybody, is, is that single person of control could it uh, could it be? replaced by some sort of a smart contract that actually feeds Oracle to the events that would kick at token issuance, if that is possible, which feels like it is, in which side does that smart contract go? And and, and, and I mean on the sense of you know, would it be on the on the on the on chain or would it be on the off chain kind of side? It would be a combination. You would have them kind of like executed on both sides. And you would execute the part of the code in the enclave, for example. So you will keep information that's known only to enclave or to group of enclaves. But at the same time, you're going to have on-chain information that will maintain cryptographic proof of the execution without actual data. That is a typical the pattern that we're going to use in the um, Hyperledger Avalon. So um, uh, we heard about the EA uh, exciting use case. We're going to hear about a couple more exciting use cases. But now I have a privilege to talk about the most infamous and the most boring use case, Hello World. So uh, without that, though, we cannot move forward. So what actually brings together the all use cases you're going to hear today about is actually that underneath we have the um, uh, Hyperledger Avalon 
uh, reference implementation of the trusted compute specification. So that is the, how Hyperledger and how the EA work together. <coughs> So before we going to the, and initially it was intended as a tutorial, so we don't have really ability to go to do this hands on. So that is why I'm going to kind of like go through the steps, what it takes to go through the, uh, to build Hello World application. But then um, first we need to start with a little bit the background. And the architectural background, the very little, just to understand what is needed absolutely to build the Hello World application. So architecturally, uh, Hyperledger alone includes three parts. It's a trusted compute service that runs the um, workloads and manages them. There, is, uh, there are smart contracts that run in Ethereum that allows you to invoke these workloads in the trusted compute service. And there are obviously requesters who want to make this execution. And, um, well, that's, colors come very differently. So now a little bit about the colors. The, um, Okay, the dark blue in this case is actually, that is the application code and the everything else uh, that is the code that is the implemented in the common for the all applications. So the applications, uh, in order to build application, you need to build three parts. The front UI, you need to build the uh, uh, smart contracts. You may use the smart contracts provided by the Hyperledger Avalon, or you may need to modify them and build your additional uh, own smart contracts. But um, in reality, these parts is actually well known how to build, but the workloads is actually very new. That is why we're going to focus today only on how to build these workloads. So we're going to pretty much build the Hello World application and learn how to uh, build your own examples. Go forward. So our Hello World application is going to be pretty simple. It's going to take as an input list of names and it's going to prepend the um, hello to each name and return this as a result. And we encourage the building the uh, application and any workload in the two stages. First, get it plugged in into the framework, and then actually like a cheating version, so it has the all components pre-installed, and it has the um, even the stage one pre-built. So it's, you can kind of like sample the uh, Avalon without really going through the full installation and see how it works. Next slide. So this is actually, let's start kind of from the end. Stage one, the, what we're going to see if the, we would have the stage one, what would be the result? So first of all, we would start the um, listener. This is the lower screen. And we would start the client application. In both cases, just when we're going to try, don't forget to uh, source the um, Python virtual environment, otherwise nothing's going to work. So when we're going to submit a command, the important parts we submit the hello world, which is the ID of the workload that we built, and there are data, Alice and Bob. So we're going to get the result error under construction. And at the end of stage one, that is the expected output, because at this time, all we care, we want to make sure that hello world would cause the uh, messages come to the our workload we, that we just integrated in the framework, but we don't really have our own business logic that yet. Next one. So what is actually it really takes to get to the stage one? First of all, we need to create a folder, like in any application, and that hello world application name we have to keep because we will need to use this name a couple times more in the updates to the files. We will need to copy template files from the uh, folder where we keep them, and they, we need to update a update couple files in the, uh, among those templates and couple more build files in the uh, framework itself. Go ahead. So the, uh, first of all, there are three files that actually allow us to build the um, Hello World uh, workload. So first, one of, first of them is actually one of the template files. That is the top one. It uh, controls how to build a static library. The second one is actually the, includes the building of this particular static library into the overall build process. And the third one is, links that into overall set of workloads to be loaded in the enclave. 
So the highlighted items is actually what really has to be changed because everything else provided as templates. Next one. Then we need to update at this stage one uh, source file, a scatter file. So we, again, we have to make the three changes. So two of them, first and last, really the same. We just need to change the namespace because if we're going to use the same templates to, uh, for multiple workloads, they should not com um, compete and should, we should keep the compiler happy. And finally, we need to set the um, workload ID. And by the way, I made a mistake. It should be hello dash world, not the hello underscore world. Next slide. Um, and this same slide. Next slide. Oops. Go back. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. So this is, okay. So this is actually, oh, okay. So this slide is actually, I just had initially the different color. <laughs> so the, um, what it actually shows here, not the changes, but the just elements that are um, important to understand why they're here. So we have to inherit from the um, workload processor class. We have to have this macro that actually allows us to clone the class for every execution we need. We need to implement this uh, uh, virtual function and we're going to look at these um, implementation a little bit later. And finally, there is a helper function that just makes adding the output elements easier. Next slide. So now, if we, we were done with this uh, stage one, so what would happen when we're going to be at this stage two? We're pretty much going to modify two more files, uh, three more files. This is uh, logic, that is where we're going to add the logic, the additional flag, uh, uh, file called plugin that CPP, that is actually the uh, file that kind of links your logic with the framework. And we rebuild this stuff, and when we run the same command, we're going to have the proper response, hello Alice and hello Bob. Next slide. So logic is actually where the developers would spend probably 99% of their time. And um, in our case, it's very primitive. It's just the function that takes the string, input string as a parameter, adds the hello, prepends it with hello, and returns the result. And the, now before we're going to look in what we actually have to change in the um, file that uh, links the, our business logic with the um, framework, we need to uh, look in the previous implementation. This is a stubbed implementation in the template. So it has this uh, macro register workload processor that just simply has to be present. There is the function process work order that has number of parameters that uh, uh, describe the workload submitted for execution. And the most important in uh, work order data and out work data. And it has a hard-coded string error under construction that is converted in byte array and returned as a result. And as you can see, it completely ignores input. Next slide. And that is the function that we are going to implement in order to link the logic of the, um, this hello world with the framework. So in this case, the for loop is actually allows you to enumerate through each input data. On the first iteration, it will have Alice. On the second, it will get Bob. Then what we're going to do, the data comes as a byte array, so they have to be converted to string and sent to the uh, command process hello world. And once they process, the result comes as a string that again has to be converted to byte array and added to the um, to the uh, work order result. And those two strings, two strings are the uh, hello Alice and hello Bob going to be returned to the um, output eventually. So the data in the process is going to pro do a lot of uh, different uh, processing. They're going to be encrypted, they're going to be uh, signed, but uh, all this is actually kind of transparent for the developer of the workload. As long as you provide this function that is going to be called, the, and you provide the uh, workload ID, the uh, framework will find your workload and will send the data to the workload for the execution. That's it.
so like uh, so, so so those are like you know around the plumbing and uh, uh, to you start using uh, you know, ES pack compliant uh, trusted compute implementation. So now uh, we like we have three case studies that uh, uh, three companies are building on top of uh, this framework. Uh, the first one is uh, from Santander, and Shmak uh, will walk us through that. How much time? Five minutes? I can take ten. I can take ten minutes. Okay. <laughs> no, you. So, so I'm. <laughs> I'm Shemek Shemian, I'm from Banco Santander, and we are kind of a special car child of EEA because we are not a software vendor, we are a bank. So we are not the smartest ones, but we are ones with interesting use cases. And we actually do have a lot of exciting use cases that we can't talk about, but there are maybe some that we can share. And SGX as a technology has been our radar. We thought it would solve us some problems, but it's difficult. Now comes Avalon, comes SDK, so hopefully, you know, we are lazy and we are always looking how to piggyback on smart people's work. And let us, let me walk you through the problem. It's, on one hand side, it's very boring because there is not much money involved. On the other hand side, it's interesting because it has many aspects that we want to cover and that are relevant in the exciting use cases. So we have three friends, Alice, Bob, and Eva. And they are friends, but they're working for competing banks. And next slide, please. And each of them has a portfolio of VIP customers that he or she takes care. And of course, it's like, you know, we are friends, but stealing a customer is a problematic thing. So next slide. With each customer set, there is customer data. Now, this customer data is precious. This customer data is something to be protected. This customer data is something we mustn't share. However, there are use cases, there are situations, there are regulatory requirements when we actually need to process consolidated data. So one very simple quasi-AML example is when we want to look for people sending money in a cycle. It's not true AML, but it's like, you know, you're making an impression of having money where, where you not really do. So this is the very simple logic that we use the uh, the templates provided by Sanji and, and Eugene, and we are contributing as an example to Avalon Hyperledger project, so that not only we have been able to do it, but well, the more so uh, smart developers could be able to do it, should be able to do it. So this is a, a question now: how to process consolidated data without disclosing it? Because we know we can have a gentleman's agreement, and we know that maybe it would work with Alice and Bob. But we all know something about Eva, right? So we mustn't trust Eva, but now comes the solution. And the solution is we do everything in a vault. We do everything in a special bunker. It's a software bunker. It's a is a bunker made of dreams of Sanji and Eugene and other people at Intel and other people from Avalon Project. So we have this cryptographically secured enclave and we seed it with a code that everybody has seen. And everybody, Alice, Bob, Eva, and whoever, I don't know why this is missing, but there are funny things happening as you move from Ubuntu to Mark to, to Windows, so there should be this person. <laughs> <laughs> so th there was this question about how to trust. Yeah? So the thing is, if you seed the enclave with your code, you can verify that this is the code, provided that you trust Sanji. <laughs> uh, but this is a minor point compared to, you know, we are a bank and people trust us with way more complex things and with 
way more rationale, uh, less rationale behind it. So, agreed upon algorithm, enclave. And now, everybody takes an envelope from the vault, and everybody puts her data into the envelope, closes, seals, and puts it into the alembic, into the vault. Now the algorithm kicks in. It's being processed, but nobody sees the assembled data because assembled data is only consolidated in the protected memory. So out comes only the list of suspects. So we have solved our problem. And a little vocabulary here. So the, the bunker is the SGX enclave wrapped in the Avalon uh, framework for our uh, utility. The envelope is a, a public RSA key. So as we start the enclave, a keeper is generated, but only the public key is revealed. So everybody in the world can encrypt, but the stuff can only get decrypted inside the enclave. Or maybe by Sanji, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> now the seal, of course, we want commitment. We want people to certify that this is the data they want to commit. So there is an elliptic curve, Kibli's curve actually, sign, signature on it. And now, a couple of questions here. So one was already asked, how can you be sure that there is no trapdoor, there is not any malicious code inside the enclave. Yeah. So this we can do by publishing the code and by publishing on chain. And this is actually where blockchain comes handy because so far you could ask, okay, cool story, but why blockchain? What for? So one thing is when you when I advertise my enclave to other banks, to other participants. I should offer a number of certificates to say to, do, to guarantee that one thing is that the code there is actually this. And then if they use attestation service, if they have those cryptographic primitives, they can verify themselves that this is actually the code. There is no trapdoor, there is no uh, funny thing. And the other question that you can ask is, how can we guarantee that people don't cheat by submitting false data? You know, if I'm Eva, Charles, if, if Charles is my customer, yeah, and uh, I want to protect him from AML algorithms, I may be sending, you know, tampered data. But this actually is a moment when again blockchain comes handy because I can gather commitments, I can gather essentially a hash of the submitted data. And then at any time in the future, an audit can come to this bank and say, okay, present the data and compare against the hash. So this is not perfect, but this is as good as can be because if we protect the data, it's protected. So there is no verification of data quality of data truthfulness, but what we can do is we can gather and uh, memorize and store the commitment for future verification. So we've done this and we are contributing uh, this as a use case. Uh, we've done this in a way that like, we are properly paranoid about cryptography. So there are two components. One is the application, and we are re we were ready to present, but you know, time constraints, network not working. One component is the client that you talk to the enclave, so that you discover the worker, that you get all the cryptographic primitives that you need, basically the keys and the addresses. And the other component is a standalone encryption application. So we say, okay, if you are really paranoid about your data. You don't want to encrypt in an app that is online connected to something. You just take the public key, you transfer it somehow, hopefully not on a Russian USB stick, 
into a, an air gap computer, you take it to the basement, there you do your encryption, there you build your JSON message, you bring it back to the application, you send it. And the, we stretch a little bit the framework because you can recognize that the worker becomes stateful because it wait, waits for all the data stakes. But this is anyhow on the roadmap of the Avalon project. Uh, there is a couple of other tweaks that we needed to do, but you know, we've managed to pull it off. So thank you very much. It's like really exciting. Uh, these are screenshots, so you know, you can uh, connect. Uh, at the moment, well, this, th th there are some funny stories. Like at the moment, the Avalon uses those pretty names to identify workers. Yeah. So normally, you, you go to blockchain, you would have a list uh, of, of workers available. These are the, the names. Something to work upon. You press details, and you get stuff that you actually need, like the encryption public key. So this is the stuff that you copy paste, and you take to your basement computer. And yeah, and the, the others of, of the uh, standalone encryption app. So first, you you need to define how many data stakes are there. Then you need to submit your data as comma separated value files. In our, you, you will be able to work with this example because we are committing this to do the Avalon project. It is already on the branch. Then you, of course, you, you create the JSON file. You may review the JSON file before it is encrypted. Then you encrypt the JSON file with the public key that you submit. So it's a very simple Python application, but it actually guides you through all the steps that you need to, to create a ready, encrypted, signed, hashed message that uh, the service would accept and process. And yes, the uh, amazing thing is it works. And I invite you to uh, experiment and play with this. Thank you. Thanks, Shama. At the, uh, the second use case we'll talk about is uh, attested oracles from uh, Joanne from uh, Chainlink. <coughs> All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much. So yeah, I'm Johan Eid, I'm from France, as you'll probably notice from my accent. Uh, so today I would like to talk about how Chainlink can connect the TCF to real-world data. So when, when we started working on Chainlink, basically what we wanted to solve was how do we bridge public blockchains to real-world data? Because after all, a public blockchain without market data, insurance data, IoT data, doesn't have a lot of use cases, right? And we feel it's the same for the TCF. So the TCF provides a great framework to scale and to compute smart contracts in a private matter. However, how can we provide this hyperledger Avalon with data, right? And how can we make sure that this data is as accurate and secure as possible? Because All right, perfect. Yeah, so currently the problem is the Hyperledger Avalon doesn't have access or safe access to data inputs. So we have this great framework which cannot access real world data, right? And all of the great use cases necessitate require uh, real world data and events. So, yeah, basically what you want to do is get access, uh, give access to the Hyperledger Avalon to payment methods, such as PayPal, Swift, where basically if you are to compute a smart contract in the TCF framework, you could trigger excellent actions, right? We also want to be able to allow the, yeah, to allow, yeah, next one, sorry. Uh, yeah, next one. <laughs> My slides are a bit, um, yeah, basically, so we have multiple use cases. So we want to allow the TCF to get access to real world data. So market data from Bloomberg, from Reuters, we also want to be able to trigger external payments with the TCF. And finally, the third use case is to basically allow the TCF to gain access to uh, other blockchains. So basically, let's say you were to compute a smart contract inside the TCF, you could trigger a Bitcoin payment or an Ethereum transaction or even an Ethereum smart contract. So 
those are all great use cases that we've been working on implementing, basically. Yeah, next one, sorry. All right, so currently we also want to guarantee end-to-end -end reliability. So the whole idea is that we use public blockchains in order to be tamper-proof, transparent, right? We use the DCF in order to scale and to guarantee privacy whenever we compute smart contracts. And we also want to make sure that the data that's being fed into this system is as secure as possible. After all, if we were to have a system which is processing real-world data inside an enclave, but you're not sure about this data, then you would run into a huge issue, right? Why do you have this super secure system which is being triggered by super insecure data? That's a problem, right? So what we've been working on at Chainlink is basically being able to have multiple sources which are fetching data from multiple data providers in order to make sure through redundancy that the data you get into your smart contract is as secure as possible. And we believe it's a huge importance for the TCF to gain access to data which offers redundancy and which offers basically incentives where people will be incentivized to provide the right uh, data points without, without being malicious whenever they are giving out this data, right? Uh, so next one. So uh, yeah, basically what you want to avoid is this architecture. You have a great robust system. So currently, um, if Ethereum and Hyperledger Avalon, right? And we don't want this great system to be triggered by one centralized oracle. Because if you have a super reliable system, it doesn't make sense to have it triggered by one single centralized oracle. That's what we want to avoid. We want to have redundancy at the oracle layer, which, where we have multiple oracles providing data from multiple data providers, right? Uh, so, next one. And yeah, that's what we implemented, basically. It's working, and we are going to commit it to the Hyperledger <coughs> Avalon. It's a way for to provide data to the TCF using Chainlink nodes. And I'm going to run you through the process, how it works exactly. So we have a requester contract, which is on-chain. So it can be on Ethereum, it can be on Hyperledger, it can be on any blockchain you could think of. And it's going to send an on-chain request to a Chainlink contract, okay? This Chainlink contract is going to send to trigger a Chainlink node. This Chainlink node is basically run by blockchain infrastructure companies who are running on Ethereum or any kind of blockchain, full, full blockchain client, and a Chainlink node. And it's going to retrieve the external data from an API endpoint. Now, this API endpoint could be Bloomberg, it could be Reuters, it could be IoT data, it could be any kind of data you could think of, right? So. Once you have retrieved the data, we feed it to an adapter. Basically, this adapter is going to encrypt the data and send the work order to the TCF. The work order is basically the sequence of operations that needs to be processed inside of the TCF. And now for the most security conscious people in this uh, room, you'll probably notice that whenever we retrieve the chain link, uh, the data and it goes through the chain link node, there is a possibility for the Oracle to corrupt the data right at this point. And that's where the beauty of TCF really comes in. Let's say I want to make sure that, I want to prove that the data hasn't been tampered with by the Chainlink node, right? I will ask the data provider to sign this data. And then I can verify that this data was signed and I can verify the signature inside of the TCF. Now, verifying signatures is a very, very consuming process, right? It's not something that you want to do on-chain. It's extremely computing. So if you were to do it inside a contract on chain, it wouldn't be a viable option to verify this data, right? However, here with Hyperledger Avalon, you can just verify the signature on the TCF level. And that's a huge value add. Basically, you can verify that the data was signed by the data provider, that your chaining node didn't tamper with it. And what you offer also is running the same data through multiple chaining nodes. So here you get attestation of the data, and you get decentralization through redundancy, through having multiple chaining nodes providing the same data points from multiple data providers, right? So we can always get more secure, but I feel like this data is already quite secure, right? What we are feeding right into the TCF has already many security assumptions that you are able to provide by combining the TCF and combining chaining nodes. Uh, so next slide. So yeah, once we have 
gotten this data, basically the process to consume it is very simple. Uh, we've computed the data, so let's say we want to, uh, let's say we have a data provider or a smart contract creator who has a use case, he wants to get a price, but he doesn't want to transmit this price on chain, right? So maybe he'll do some computation off chain using the TCF and he'll return the request, or the result, sorry. Uh, using the same process, we go through the adapter, we go through the chaining node, the chaining node feeds the answer to the chaining contract, which feeds it into the consumer contract. So a very easy process. Um, now, I didn't give any clear kind of use case, just because the use cases for this are limitless. You can get any kind of API endpoint to feed data to your smart contracts using the TCF and using chaining nodes. And here it goes from insurance contracts to global trade to trade finance. Basically, any kind of use cases that needs data, doesn't want this data to be published on chain because financial, comp financial uh, uh, enterprises or company maybe don't really want to publish all their trades on chain, right? But still want to use the security guarantees that TCF and uh, Ethereum and public blockchains offer. So that's a beautiful way to do it, basically. And the, uh, possibilities are limitless. So I think I probably ran out of time, so I'm gonna end here. I had a few other slides, but I think it's fine. Um, yeah, just, I would like to finish by saying, I think that was a beautiful effort that uh, many companies led through EEA, through Hyperledger, and yeah, I'm really excited to see where it's gonna go. Um, these use cases are really limitless, and in the future, what you're creating here will have a huge impact in the, on the industry, I think, and drive companies to start using public blockchains more and more. So, thank you very much. So now uh, we have the last question, Sean from Egma. Hi uh, everyone, my name is John Sagun, I'm uh, one of the co-founders uh, at Enigma and I did product there with my colleague Ainsley, who's back there in the room. Um, today it's, it's great that I get blessed uh, because you mentioned an application which back in technologies, we focus primarily on public blockchains. Uh, the way we try to do this is by enabling blockchains, uh, public or private, to handle sensitive data. And uh, we've built a, a computation platform um, that enables blockchain functions or smart contracts to run with encrypted inputs and this is done using the TCF uh, framework. Um, so, uh, ah, perfect. Uh, I guess the problem of privacy is very obvious, I'm not going to spend time on this, this is something that's been very dear to us. We started our research in 2015 when we were students at MIT and uh, at the time we were focusing on multi-party computation. Um, we wrote two papers that are among the most cited in the industry. Fast forward four years, uh, we're at the place where uh, we're about to launch our network, which um, again introduces this concept of a secret contract. A secret contract is a smart contract that um, can run with encrypted inputs. Um, and uh, we are seeing that this has a lot of use cases in the public blockchain, public blockchain ecosystem, both in terms of enabling new applications that haven't existed before, but also creating a much better UX uh, in, in certain use cases. Um, today I'm going to talk about Discovery, which is the first uh, release, uh, which will be the first release of our network in the next couple of months. Uh, Discovery is interesting because it's an implementation of TCF. Uh, we actually went our separate ways, but we converged on the same spec, more or less. Um, it improves on the TCF in two ways. One is, it is a stateful network where the state is private. And the second thing is, it is uh, compatible with Ethereum, which means something that, uh, or, or a contract that executes on Enigma can uh, call a contract on Ethereum to move funds, to mint tokens, or, or store records uh, of that sort. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about the network very quickly. Um, the developers who build apps similar to Ethereum, uh, users who interact with these apps, um, and then uh, finally workers who execute these tasks. These workers run uh, Intel SGX devices, and uh, that's how the network achieves its privacy feature. Um, on a high level, the way the network works is the, the middle thing I have there is, is the secret contract concept. Um, in this network, uh, again, the interesting thing is 
the inputs are encrypted and the state is encrypted at all, at all times. So um, what happens is the user sends the input. While users are sending the input, they're using our library, which, uh, which ensures encryption uh, locally and then sends the encrypted input to the network. Then uh, we have built a P2P network where all the uh, um, basically state is kept and the communication takes place. Uh, that also is encrypted at all times. The worker who's chosen to work on this task based on a proof of stake algorithm, has the ability to decrypt both the inputs and the, uh, and the state of a contract, uh, do a computation on it, um, and then update the Enigma state. Once the Enigma state is updated, it remains encrypted, it is uh, visible to the user who has created the transaction, and as I mentioned, uh, we can do uh, computation on it. Here, let's wait for a second. Um, I was gonna focus a bit more um, on uh, how this applies to enterprise, but I think it's, it's, it's interesting to show how this can be um, a use case that can be used on public Ethereum. So what I want to do is I want to talk a bit more about like what uh, we're building or what people are building using this, uh, this system. Um, we recently built a, a coin mixer to achieve transactional privacy on Ethereum. Uh, we see all of the zero knowledge based implementations that, that try to do that. Um, we, we use our network and the secret contracts in a way to collect encrypted recipient addresses and then shuffle them in order to achieve transactional privacy. Uh, there are a lot of DeFi use cases that are interested in this. Um, there is a lot of use cases that require auctions uh, in order to create efficient marketplaces. This could be things like creating order books or this could be things like, um, like um, having an auction to say like creating a fixed income product using uh, the interest swaps uh, on, on the DeFi ecosystem. So there are things uh, that are around this. Uh, this applies to a lot of gaming uh, situations that we see where there's a multiplayer uh, situation. A very simple example is rock, paper, scissors, but you can take it to the next level and build a poker game that is completely decentralized and cannot be shut down by governments, which I think is very interesting. Um, governance kind of falls into it because voting uh, and things like that require comment reveals, uh, can, can hugely benefit from it. Um, and, and that's uh, the, uh, the, the interest and attraction we we're primarily seeing in the, in the public Ethereum um, level. I think one thing that's interesting uh, for uh, the enterprise folks that are in the ecosystem is, uh, and this maybe sound a bit bold, but uh, I think it's a point worth making. I don't think personally the current enterprise blockchains significantly improve. Um, <laughs> on the uh, status quo of having uh, databases. And the reason for that is primarily around privacy. We have a lot of uh, consortium blockchains which create further data silos and have the, and fail the ability to tap into the network effects that, uh, like, that, you know, that create value. Uh, with something like Enigma, this can be addressed to an, to an address because now you can have um, an actual blockchain where you know you can connect to different blockchains and parties who have conflicting business interests can interact with each other without revealing anything both from their business logic and um, and you know things that trigger their contracts so we think this is interesting uh, going forward we're excited to uh, contribute to these specs the e uh, the hyperledger avalon specs uh, mostly on how to do uh, share knowledge on how to do uh, stateful uh, computations around um, the the, the specs. So that's uh, my presentation. Thank you very much. I'm not going to